In today's show, we're talking New Orleans Pelicans with Jake Madison of the Locked On Pelicans podcast, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. We're talking about a Pelicans team that gets back a giant superstar in however way you want to take the word giant. He's a big man and he's a big star. It's Zion Williamson, and we're going to talk about that and this squad with Jake Madison. So, warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. (laughs) Jake, welcome back to the show. Are you there? Or did you freeze? Oh, okay. I was, I was like, are you, are you, are you waiting on me here? <laughs> we, we, we got the, uh, the little like happy intro and everything. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, Josh. It's good to have you here, Jake. This is a really interesting team that we're going to talk about the New Orleans Pelicans. And there's lots of questions that we need to answer, but we always start these shows by just looking at who, who joined the team and who left the team. And the list is pretty small for guys who actually joined the roster. Dyson Daniels is there. Darian Sebron is a two-way guy. They lost Tony Snell, RIP, um, to Tony Snell being a guy that just hangs around and plays minutes for no reason at all. They've still got Gary. Doesn't miss free throws. When's the last time he missed one? 2016? It's like 20, yeah, something like that. He's he's only, I think he's made 150 in a row or something like that, but it's been a, it's been a lot of years. He's gone, but they've still got Garrett Temple to fill that role of the bloke where you go, why is this guy on the court? Jared Harper and Gary Clark got minutes last season, but is Dyson Daniels even going to play on this team? It's a good question, right? When you, I, when you ask me who kind of the five bench guys are, I don't think I included him in that no, because they're, I don't want to say this team's deep, right? Because I don't actually feel that. I just look at when you see some of the guys that could be playing, he's going to have to work his way up. If yeah. he can get on the court with his defense, that'll help. He's a good enough passer. Those are things that should help him see the court. But I think when you look at the rotation right now, it's going to be a little bit before he he really cracks it. Yeah, I think so too. I, I, you'll get sporadic minutes here and there, but he's not going to be like, bang, he has 22 minutes off the bench and work your way into things. I don't see how that's going to happen. We didn't really see anything of him in summer league either. So I just don't think we're going to see much of him this season. But the big question that we all want to know, it's a big question for a big man. It's Zion Williamson. Is is he ready? He's surely ready, isn't he? We, we're, we're hoping so. And look, I'll be honest. I've been calling him Zion 2.0 because this feels like a different version of him from his first couple of years in the league. And in one sense, that should terrify the rest of the NBA because his sophomore year, the dude was good. When he played actually the majority of the season, he was amazing. He wasn't in that great shape, right? I don't know if he was really fully bought into what this team was doing. And kind of all of those concerns right now are raised. He signed the extension, so he's tied to New Orleans for the foreseeable future. So that's all kind of removed from it, right? He seems really bought into what Coach Willie Green is doing. You know, he he jetted off to Portland to rehab at Nike, kind of by himself, went a little rogue, and then came back about a month earlier than the team was expecting him to be back around because this Pelican his team was having a lot of fun to get into the playing tournament then into the playoffs and it seemed like zion realized that and just wanted to be around them so kind of getting him like mentally bought into this team i think is an important thing and now it looks like he's actually in shape i mean i'm sure you've seen pictures of him others have i was at his uh press conference for the contract signing like he looks like like duke zion to a certain degree but probably just stronger so if you're going to tell me you're going to give me an in-shaped zion williamson who's like mentally all there and bought in I feel pretty good about that yeah I, I do too like he was great I had him as an all NBA guy in year two like that's how good I thought his season was and I think there's there's so much room for him to actually get better from there and it is a frightening thing to see that how good he can be we just want him out on the court how cautious do you think they will be with him in terms of minutes and games played this coming season like I'm not as worried as others are. I think he's going to be like, just it's for fantasy basketball, he's going to have some huge numbers. Um, I, I don't think he's going to be out there. They're going to be saying, oh yeah, play 27 minutes and yeah, sit every single back-to-back. He'll have some games missed for sure. 
I don't think they'll be as cautious as a lot of the uh, the doomers might be suggesting. No, I mean, look, that's that was a big part of the the reason his camp and him kind of had like a frosty relationship with the team for a while. It went back to his rookie year where yeah. they brought him back on like a minutes restriction. And he was like, look, at one point they were very concerned that like he had played his last game for the team. I can tell you that with a lot of confidence. So I don't think they're going to try and repeat those mistakes. And David Griffin, the vice president of basketball operations, has repeatedly said, you know, he has no restrictions none whatsoever so he can go and do whatever he wants i don't think you can really be saying that right now and then be like oh but we're not going to play him 31 minutes he can only play 30 so i think he's going to be just like fully unleashed and fully ready to go at the start of the regular season so ingram played 34 mccullum played 35 last season is, is that realistic if it is i'm pretty bloody excited yeah i, I think so right like you have to imagine they're going to keep at least one of those three guys, when you include Zion and that on the court at any given time, probably you could afford to keep two on yeah. the court at any given time to a certain degree. If you stagger it right, there's no reason those guys can't get a ton of minutes, each of them. And I know there's, you know, there's only one basketball, right? But if you stagger them right, I think they can all be the focal point at times too. So I think those minutes will stay around there. CJ's might come down a little bit just because kind of his age a little bit is kind of the advanced guy there, um, you know, on the wrong side of 30, but I don't think they'll drop a ton and he's going to be in a really great role to see him thrive this year. So I would imagine you'll see Zion, Brandon Ingram and CJ McCollum all playing like, you know, what, 33, 34 to 36 minutes per game. Yeah. I, I, I tend to agree. Again, I'm not one of those who's like, oh, they're going to really limit him and yeah, he's going to sit every back to back and you'll play 50 games and I, I think he's going to get some really big minutes out there and put up some really big numbers Kyra Lewis was a guy I was really excited about as a draft prospect I thought he slid too far he has really struggled in the NBA and then he tore his ACL with the drafting of Dyson Daniels where's his team viewing him at the moment like are they just out on him and anything they get is a bonus like like I guess we're expecting like a December January return for him like what's his future in the organization yeah, I wouldn't say they're out on him, right? I think they were very high on him drafting him. I think it was 13th overall. But as you said, right, like even his first two years in the league, you know, before that injury there, he hadn't really impressed or necessarily looked like the 13th overall pick. You know, it's he was he was one of the more raw prospects, I thought, coming into that draft. He's one of the younger guys too, right? If you look at, I forget his age right now, but he's still incredibly young for a guy who's going to be a third-year player here. So I think they look at him as, you know, as you said, December, January, January and kind of whatever you get out of him, it, it, we call it lanyap here in New Orleans, where it's like just a little bit extra or something like that. I think they'll take that from him. But when you start to look at the rotation, you know, there's a couple guys here that feel like they're kind of odd people out. And when he returns, right, like, are they going to give him minutes to kind of work his way back into basketball shape? And I'm not sure that they're going to, especially if they're being a playoff and a competitive team like they hope to be. So he just seems like the guy that due to circumstance might kind of be the odd man out in that guard rotation. He's actually younger than the guy we're going to talk about now. That's EJ Liddell, who they drafted in the second round, who seemed to slide quite a bit, was touted some in some places as a top 20 pick, but they got in the second round, tore his ACL in Summer League. Is there any movement on what's, what they're doing with him contract-wise? Are they just going to, are they going to sign him? And even though he's rehabbing, are they going to just hold his rights for a year? Like, what, what's going to happen there? Yeah, I'm not sure, right? You know, they have very limited options to do it. They don't really have a roster spot for him right now. We were wondering how they were going to clear space on the team mm. to sign him to an NBA contract and not a two-way deal, but that's, you have to imagine, is certainly out the window right now. Um, I think they'll look to maybe put him on that other two-way deal. You mentioned Sebron. He's on the first one. You know, I don't think they really need both two ways completely filled with guys that like could make the team this year, even though they've had a lot of success with that the past couple of seasons. So I wouldn't be shocked if they try and throw him on that other two way deal, give him some guaranteed money, bring him along slowly. It was a guy they were really high on. They had him as a first round grade. So to get him at 41, 42, whatever it was, they were really excited about and thought he fit this team pretty well as a guy they could develop eventually. So, you know, they'll do something to kind of do right by him and then just kind of see if he pans out in the future, I think. We'll talk about starting lineups and other rotation stuff in a second, Jake. But before we go do that, if you have issues with you know, just managing your money, balancing budgets, looking at credit card payments, uh, trying to be, you know, if you're scared of looking at your bank statements, I've got a solution for you. We've heard about Truebill before. They've got a new name. It is Rocket Money. And it's not just about those subscriptions. It's an all-encompassing 
what's it, what do they call it? An all-encompassing personal finance empowerment tool, helping over 3.4 million people with budgeting, lowering bills, canceling subscriptions, and more, saving each of their members on average 700 bucks a year. It's a new name. It's a new evolution in True Bill's story. It is called Rocket Money. Is now um, being backed by Rocket Companies. That's part of the reason for the name change, but just also to show everything else they are doing. So bottom line is Rocket Money is everything that you have loved about Truebill in the past, but it's a fresh new look and feel and more functions. So start canceling your unused subscriptions and save money at rocketmoney.com slash locked on MBA. That's rocketmoney.com slash locked on MBA or download the app from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Starting five. Yep, this is straightforward. I think Jake, CJ, Herb Jones, Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson, Jonas Valanciunas. I don't really see what other direction they would go. They went with this exact lineup last season, except it was Jackson Hayes in place of Zion Williamson. So that's that's it. This is what it is. Yeah, th- there, there's no question on this. That's going to be the starting lineup. Like, I, like, there's just not much more to say, no, right? I want to go in depth on it. And then it's just like, yeah, there's no questions here. Well, I'm not going to talk about Brandon Ingram too much. What do you, what do you think of his new look that we saw? The uh, the scruffy homeless... Uh... Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, he looks like a, a a player out of like the '70s or something, lo- right? Like oh, you give so him some cool. like high socks, he the looks, short shorts, oh right? He's gonna look awesome. He looked awesome. I, the look was unbelievable. I thought he looked fantastic. Um, we'll talk about those guys a little bit more. Herb Jones. Everyone looks okay. Second year, big step up. Where, where does it happen for him? Like, how does it happen with Zion back? I'm not. I don't think he's like he's clearly the fifth offensive option in that group. He put up like historic type defensive numbers, which has there's always room for some small regression in those numbers when you put up such big numbers there. Like, does Herb? Where does Herb Jones get better? So I think it's two areas, right? Like, first and foremost, I don't know. Three point shooting is probably where he's going to fit in offensively to just be a spot up catch and shoot guy, right? Like the big knock on him and probably one of the biggest reasons why he slid in the draft and fell to the second round was people didn't think he could shoot. I don't think he's a great shooter, but he shot 34%, 33% from three last year on limited attempts. That's not nearly as bad as maybe what we were expecting it to be from him at the NBA level. So if he can bump that up a couple of percentages, if he can get to 36% on three attempts per game, you can probably live with something like that with him being your fifth option offensively. But Willie Green has also mentioned that he's going to handle the ball some this year. And I think that's going to kind of be the secret area offensively that they're trying to Use him. I think they look at it by him handling the ball. I think they look at him as being a guy who can get a defensive rebound and then take it up the court in a fast break kind of opportunity and to try and get him into some early offense. And if you go back to his time at Alabama, he played a little bit of point guard for them at times or point forward. So he has that to some degree in his skill set. I don't think he's going to be a Chris Paul type point guard for this team, but as a guy that, you know, when you look at that starting lineup, right? All four of those five guys can grab the defensive rebound and take it up the court pretty quickly and push the pace of play. And so I think they'll give Herb Jones opportunities to do that. You know, I don't know if I want him doing that over some of the other guys, but if the opportunity's there, take it and go. But it's that and it's going to be the three-point shooting. Yeah, that's, that's it. I think the biggest surprise last season, because 33 is, is fine, and we talked about how much he improved because he did, because he was like a 20-something percent shooter in college. But yeah. he jumped like 20 percentage points on his free throw shooting. He was like a 66 or 67 guy at Alabama, and he was like 84 last season. And that's that's the big thing that makes you go, okay, well, there is still more room for growth, I think, in his shooting, that he was able to correct that real free throw issue and turn it into a strength, much like Brandon Ingram did when he arrived in New Orleans as well. So yeah, shout out Fred Vincent for getting that on track. And yeah, we'll see what more improvements there are. Now, the bench rotation is more interesting. You've got Devontae Graham, Jose Alvarado, Trey Murphy, Larry Nance, and Jackson Hayes. And Larry Nance is one of those players where I think a lot of people go, oh yeah, he's uh, he's on the Pelicans. I Honestly, it's one of those things that always slips in my mind. Let's look at point guards. Is it Alvarado or Graham who gets first crack at things here coming off the bench? So this is, I actually struggled with this, right? I think one of them had like a question mark when I, when I sent it to you and it might've been Devonte Graham. Um, it's probably going to be Jose Alvarado. I think they really like what he brings to the table. What everyone kind of loved from him in that playoff series against the Phoenix Suns, right? Yes. He's undersized, but he's kind of got that like grittiness, that hustle factor that you really like in a guy like that. He can handle the ball well enough and orchestrate an offense just enough. You know, he can run some pick and roll, you know, he's not a lead at it. He's not a major 
amazing at it, but for limited minutes, because you have, I think in that starting lineup, a lot of like half to 75% ball handlers rather than a pure ball handler. He's not going to need to do that a ton. So you bring him out there for some defensive assignments to really bother some opponents and he can hit threes as well. So I think he's probably going to get the nod over Devonte Graham because frankly, I don't think Devonte Graham gave them much of anything last year other than like two game winners which probably helped them get into the playing tournament thus the playoffs but those are you know we're not going to just rely on him hitting 80 foot three the craziest, pointers to win a game craziest game winner i've ever seen i reckon that one against the thunder that's one of the most that's one of the <laughs> stupidest things that ever happened in that game but he played 28 minutes a night Devonte graham like all right over under he loses 10 minutes a game this season oh it's probably that's a good question okay so i'll say it's under 10 but it might be like seven minutes per game or something along those lines right it's going to be closer to 10 than not closer to 10 i'd say yep. it's just he doesn't give you defense right his three-point shooting was not good last year he had some big shots but they, they they traded a protected first round pick which they then used in the cj mccullum trade and got kind of lucky with that for him right and gave him a somewhat big money deal though he's making like 11 million a year it's not an egregious amount of money he just didn't give him much of anything right like he's a guy that you put out there that's going to miss three pointers for you more than he's going to make them and on this team i just don't think you can really play a guy like that a ton yeah no and you know, getting cj in to just basically replace him and drafting dyson daniels and getting kyra lewis and the ascension of jose alvarado he is very much uh on the outside there trey murphy someone i really like i was pretty Upset, I don't know if upset the sorry word, annoyed that Willie Green just wouldn't play him to begin the season. And then we saw him start to work into a large role. All right, out of this group, these five guys on the bench, which one of those is most likely to close games? I think it's Trey Murphy playing with Valanchunas maybe coming to the bench at times. I think Trey could push into mid-20s in minutes. I'm really excited about what he brings and that shooting alongside Zion I think is, is exciting. But yeah, am, am I being crazy here? No, I think you're dead on. That's that's exactly what I've said. I did a show on this recently, actually, a couple shows about it, right? Like, he's a guy I think can close games and almost you run a super small lineup or mm. something like that. Valanciunas comes out and he goes in. He's grown this summer. If you look at him, he's taller than what he was listed at this past year. He's probably closer to 6'10 right now than he was before, and he's already a dead-eye shooter. Um you know, he's going to, I think, of, if you saw him in the playoffs, the Pelicans, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, were uh, plus crazy numbers when he was on the court versus when he wasn't. And I think that's something that Willie Green is going to realize and learn from and give him significant minutes. You're going to need him to space the court, right? Teams aren't going to cover shooters when Zion's out there until maybe midway through the season when guys actually start making their three-pointers. And you're, one of your better chances of that happening is going to be Trey Murphy. He also has so much position versatility i don't think he's quite there yet to do it for significant minutes but we've seen him at times guard fives he did it in summer league where he did a very good job on evan mobley two years ago we've seen him guard fives a little bit now so i wonder if he can kind of grow into that role as a small ball five for this team so you have that starting lineup you sub out valentunas you put him in there you still remain okay enough defensively and you add more shooting that's a lineup that i'm really excited to see this season I think it's more, uh, this is you know, tying into that Devontae Graham question, I think it's more likely that Trey Murphy gets 29 minutes a night than he gets 15 minutes a night. I think that they should lean on him heavily. Oh, yeah. um, I'm really excited to see what he does. And he, in terms of standard fantasy leagues, like taking a guy like him as a last pick and we don't know what the rotation is going to be. And that also worries me a little bit about Valanciunas because my thing with Valanciunas, he played great last season. I was always like, We'll see what happens when Zion comes back. We'll see what happens when Zion comes back. Well, Zion's back now. So I expect Valanciunas to lose a little bit of playing time this season. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, and I think he actually needs that to be to be certainly uh, to be certain with you. You know, I think he played as uh, almost a career high in minutes per game or something along those lines this past season, and I think you could see it start to wear on him. Yeah, he played a career high in minutes per game at a shade over thirty last year. You could see it started to wear on him as the season went on. I think you probably need to have him actually under thirty minutes per game. It might be like twenty seven, twenty eight, but just to take a little bit of that load off of him. I thought he was pretty underrated last year. He's just a super consistent center when it comes to scoring and rebounding. I don't think he's abysmal defensively either. And he can give you a little bit of three point shooting at times, which is nice though. I don't think that's something people should bank on, but I think he needs to kind of scale back his minutes a little bit, but certainly when it comes to Trey Murphy, like he needs to be, in my opinion, playing closer to 30 minutes, I think um, than like 20 or anything like that. So 
who plays more minutes, Valanciunas or Murphy? It's a good question. You know, I think it's it, by the end of the season, it's probably Murphy. I think. I think he's going to be kind of their their first guy off the bench. And I think when you just look at lineups with Zion, with Brandon Ingram, and the fact that he is pretty good defensively and he's a very good shooter, and then all the advanced numbers say he does better on the court, uh, that's an important thing, right? And you have some backup center minutes that you can give to a guy like Larry Nance Jr. and others too. So I think I think it'll be close. But I think it'll end up being Trey Murphy. I also feel Murphy's maybe just a little bit more durable. So if you factor in just like injuries that are going to happen, it seems like something might happen to Valanciunas more so than Murphy. Yeah, I'm really excited. To see. Look, it could completely blow up in our faces. Shout out to Nikhil Alexander-Walker. But I'm really interested to see. I was never high on him. <laughs> oh, there was plenty of people who were last season. I was a little bit in on him, but he just was, he was dreadful. And I don't even know where he goes from here. But that's a story for another day. Wait till I talk to David about him uh, later on. But we're going to hear talk about the Pelicans. Um, and I'm excited to see what Murphy can do. And we'll see how that pans out. All right. Are we going to see more of Point Zion or more of Center Zion? That's uh, a good question, too. I think it's more point Zion. You know, when you look at that that starting lineup, right? Like, there's not a pure point guard there. There's not a guy that you would call a one. And so I think they're going to kind of go almost like point guard by committee to a certain degree, right? Like, I'd call Brandon Ingram probably like 60% of the ball handler. Zion's probably 50% of a ball handler. CJ's maybe closer to 50%. We could throw Herb Jones like a quarter of a percent in there, and all of that kind of adds up to at least above 100 there of a ball handler. So there are all going to have chances to kind of handle the ball and create for others and so because of that i think you'll still see zion being more point zion kind of at the four with other guys playing the five he's not good defensively right like you no. can't have him guarding fives like that's just not something that is going to work at least right now in his career and something that i'm not sure if it'll ever work in his career, you can have him play there offensively, but when you talk about these guys in those positions, it's kind of who are they guarding, right? So I think he's going to be more of point Zion. Though I don't think you'll see it as much as we saw it at times his his second year in the league, but you'll certainly still see it plenty. And just, I mean, the guy shot 71% at the rim his second year in the league, right? Like he's as efficient, as deadly of an ISO score as there is in the NBA. The court gravity that that guy just has purely with the ball in his hands and teams needing to sell out to stop him is going to create open looks. You know, I, I, the numbers on it equate to, I think him and his uh, shooting percentage at the rim, it's something like a 46% shooter from three, right? So if you have to defend an open three-point shooter or double Zion, you're probably going to double Zion till the corner shooters eventually start making them in such volume that you have to try and, try and avoid that. So I think that's where you'll still see a lot of points on because it just bends defense like that. I've got Zion, CJ, and Brandon Ingram all averaging around five assists per game. Who who would you be your pick to lead the team in assists? I think it's probably Brandon Ingram, to be perfectly honest. You know, we saw him put up some really great numbers with that last year, and that's with, like, defenses all over him, too. I think they're still going to kind of throw doubles at him again. He kind of arrived to a certain degree in the playoffs, and he averaged still 5.6 per game last season. Those are really good numbers, and I think he's still growing with that. He averaged six in the postseason, too. I think there's no reason that he can't kind of uh, repeat those numbers yet again, but I think around five for all of those guys sounds about right. Yeah, it's going to be sort of a bit of back and forward with that sort of soccer. Ingram's like numbers were, were obviously really, really strong last season in terms of um, getting assists. So we'll see how that all plays out. It is going to be intriguing to see that. And that takes me on to my next question, Jake, because I believe this will be the case. But how do you think CJ is going to accept being the third offensive option? I think he'll probably be okay with it. I think, again, because you can run at least one of those guys out there or two of those guys out there at all times, he won't just kind of be relegated to that third role the whole period of time. And he's going to get so many wide open <laughs> three-point shots that, like, he should be thrilled about this, right? Like, if you've got – again – when, when Zion scores the rim at that degree, are you going to cover CJ on, you know, saying on, on above the break three or double Zion, right? Like, what do you do if you're a coach? They usually tend to take away the rim to a certain degree, right? So guys are going to be open. And just the fact that there's enough threats out there offensively, it probably means CJ is going to get a lot of wide open three-point looks. 
he should be thrilled that he just kind of at times is going to get to stand right there and just launch the, the most open looks he's probably seen in his career. And he just definitely kind of, I think, understands his role, right? And it's kind of an all about the team kind of guy, even if that means he has to take a little bit of a step back. He seems like he really wants to win. He seems really bought into everything that they're doing here. He said he's wants he wants to retire a New Orleans Pelican. So when you kind of factor all that in, I, I'm not really worried about you know him being upset or anything like that they're gonna also give him eventually a big time extension too that you know i don't know maybe money in 40 million 30 million a year whatever he'll get is gonna end up making him happy uh, i know i've given you a lot of statistical guess questions here but let's do another one over under 20 points per game for cj so this is something i've gone back and forth on right can all three of those guys get above 20 points per game is kind of the question right that's what this this ends up equating to yes yeah, I, I think he can. Again, if he's out there with him, Zion, and three bench guys, he's going to be able to get the ball and go out and score and kind of still do his thing. They still do lack at times, particularly in closing games, kind of self-creation. That was one of the big reasons they brought him in. CJ's not just a catch-and-shoot guy. He's a pull-up guy. He can do it off the dribble with the ball in his hands. I don't really have anyone else outside of Brandon Ingram, and B.I. struggles with that to a certain degree, I think. Zion's kind of a different deal with that, but you still need some self-creation out there on the perimeter, and that's CJ as basically the only guy on the roster that can do that he's still going to get plenty of opportunities I, you know i'm not saying he will go above 20 points per game but like if you tell if you told me that that's going to happen like yeah totally i've got no problems with that being the bet or something like that i've got him at the moment at like 19.2 so pretty close they're going to be all around that the other, the other two have got no problem they're going to clear 20 no worries zion literally might clear 30 if things all go 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 what do you average like 27 on like 62 true shooting as a second year player it's, it's so stupid like all of his numbers that that second year at age 20 were yeah. like disgusting then all the advanced stats that you look at with it they're all like ridiculous and again we get 2.0 zion here who's in good shape we've never seen him in like good basketball shape i'm really excited about it i'm excited as well so is he the breakout candidate on this team I think it could be him. I think it could be Trey Murphy, yeah, right? Like, if, I don't know if I could call like Zion averaging 30 points per game after he had a 27 point per game season, like a true breakout player. I think it could be Trey Murphy, who's probably in line for a big minutes boost, a big role boost too, and is going to get tons of open three point looks. I think like if you're looking at this of like, who are we going to think differently about at the end of the season? It might be Zion because we haven't seen him for the past year. And I think he's going to put to bed a lot of those like fat jokes and all of like those things. That's going to probably get laid to rest this season. But if you're tr talking about a player who like exceeded expectations, who went in, and you're like, oh, that dude's good. It's probably going to be Trey Murphy. Yeah, I agree with all that stuff. I, I hope it's like I hope Zion just puts up a huge um, season. Look, number one, he's my son's favorite player, and just bought him a pair of Zion shoes for his birthday, and uh, it's just bloody fun to watch. And he just goes out and dominates. So, I, and I like Trey Murphy a lot as well. But what about on the other side? I think it's probably Jonas Valanciunas as a regression candidate, but. Who would you peg for that role? Well, not if it, not a role. Who's going to fill that category? <laughs> It'd be a crappy role to try and fill. Right? <laughs> hey, like, we want you to be worse this season. All right, no, no worries, coach. I, I don't know. Can Can Garrett Temple be worse so no. that they never play him again? Oh, well, that'd be no. <laughs> he, 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 more than that, like. Can he be worse? Willie Green's obsession with him at the beginning of the year was the most like head scratching thing. <laughs> when just everything said this guy is so. So, so bad. Even Tony Snell minutes at times were like, what is he doing playing some of these guys? Yeah, it's it's probably Valanciunas, right? Like, partially it's going to be with Zion back, the paint's going to be a little bit more crowded. You know, that probably makes his life a little bit tougher for things. Like, I don't want him being stuck out there on the perimeter launching threes. He really only hits threes against the Clippers for whatever reason. You know, he can, he can make some of them, but like, you don't want him playing out there. His minutes probably do go down a little bit. So because of that, like, he's just in line to, to step back a little bit, though I don't think it's going to be like a big thing and I don't think it's anything to like really be concerned about. If you're looking for another player, it's something I messaged you about, right? Like Jackson Hayes, yeah. You know, what's his role going to be this coming season? I don't really know. And he feels big time like an odd man out, you know, also being an expiring deal. He's due an extension or a new contract. His career kind of like hangs in the balance this season, I think, to a certain degree and like not in a good way. Yeah, he, he put up some interesting performances towards the end of last season, but like the role just... It's just not there. That role's just not there for him this season. So where he goes, I have no idea. Now, this is an easy one, Jake. Is this team better this season? 
<laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say that this team is better. Look, they got off to a one in 13 start <laughs> last year and still like managed to like kind of turn it around and be a significantly better team by the end of the year. Uh, when Brandon Ingram and CJ were both in the starting lineup, I think they played 600 basketball during that time with just those two guys. So now you add Zion back in. Everyone likes Willie Green as a head coach. Like, yeah, this team's definitely better than they were a season ago. Who's the most likely player to be traded? Probably Jackson Hayes. Yeah. Uh, he's just an odd man out, right? Like he started power forward for the majority of the year, but that's Zion's spot. I don't know if they really like playing him at center. You've got Larry Nance Jr. That's going to take some of those minutes too. You still have Trey Murphy there too. Like, I just don't see what his role is. And so like similar to kind of like Nikhil Alexander Walker a year ago, right? Like guy who they gave opportunities to and just kind of never truly rose to like fill a starter job ends up probably meaning you're the guy who's going to go or, or it could be Devonte Graham. I just don't know if anyone wants to take on that Devonte Graham contract. Not that it's like a huge albatross or anything, but you know, for a guy that doesn't hit three pointers, you really want to pay him $12 million a year. There's probably not many teams that do. Yeah, that's, that's true. And they're, they're the two that clearly come to my mind as well. We're going to end things out here, Jake, with a quiz. Basketball index has a bunch of metrics that they run to, to determine the talent of players. So we're going to quiz you on players from last season on the Pelicans who graded out as the best three-point shooting talent, the best playmaking talent, and finishing talent. That's not just who had the best three-point shooting percentage. It's not who had the most assists. It's not who had the best field goal percentage at the rim. It's about volume and difficulty of shots and difficulty of passes and high-value passes and potential assists and driving and hitting through contact and all that sort of stuff to work out who the best player is there. So with your esteemed knowledge of this Pelicans team, who was the best three-point shooting talent on the Pelicans last season? So you, before I answer this, you've been tripping up all the locked on hosts with these, haven't you? I've seen some yeah. of them complaining, like the quiz has been pretty hard. And so <laughs> now I'm kind of near, I should have done some studying for this. Um, I, I'll go. It's, it's CJ McCollum just too obvious for three point shooting talent. Like that's who I'm going to go with here because that seems to make the most sense, but I could also maybe see Trey Murphy getting in there too. It was CJ McCollum, the volume of okay. it, the difficulty of the shots, the pull-up nature, the self-creation. It was him. Don't You don't have to overthink them too much. You don't have to overthink <laughs> this one either. Who was the uh, playmaking talent leader for this team? Uh, give me Brandon Ingram here. There you go. Two from two. Jake, you know what you're talking about. What about finishing? Now, obviously, if Zion was playing last season, it, it, <laughs> there's no doubt it would have been him. This one did surprise me somewhat. Who had the best finishing grade? Again, it's a, yeah, driving is important. Finishing through contact, drawing fouls, um, percentage at the rim, all that stuff is a part of it. It's it's between three guys, right? Like, I if, is this the trick one? Is this the trick question here? I think it's because if it's it a is a trick, yeah. Is it Jackson Hayes? It's not. It's not Jackson Hayes. It was maybe you don't think it's a trick. It was actually CJ McCollum who graded out. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, which I didn't really expect. The other two. Yeah, they were fine. And last question. All right. Which five-man group of players that are still on the roster had the highest net rating last season? Oh, okay. Um, CJ, Brandon, Brandon Ingram, let's put those two in there just mm -hmm. right off of the bat. Um, Jose Alvarado? He was not in that group. Oh, interesting. I already screwed it up. Um, I got no idea then. All right, so it was... They're all still on the roster. They so. are. It's, f it's four of the projected starters for this season. And Trey Murphy was in that group. They didn't play. They didn't play huge amounts together, but I think they were like a plus thirty in the hundred minutes or so that they played. So they were they were right up there. Again, I just wanted to put that in there because I just want to highlight. That I think Trey Murphy's really good, and I want to see how this. Told all, you the on-off numbers were crazy with him. They were. They were. And this year, the best lineup of players still on the team involved him in that group. Jake, that'll do it for us today. Thanks for coming on and chatting about the New Orleans Pelicans and uh, giving us your insight on this team, which is going to be a much must-watch team all season. What's going on at Locked On Pelicans? at the moment uh we're gonna have some fun previewing the season just doing the standard kind of spinning the wheels on the off-season stuff right now but soon it's going to kind of be diving into these guys by position what are their roles going to be you know if you really want the the good show i've got up there right now it's the small ball lineup do they have a, a warrior's death lineup with trey murphy in there i broke down a lot of the numbers on that too so a lot of great stuff and i can't wait for the season to get started Go and check out Jake uh, wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. He's the, the king of the uh, the thumbnail and uh, of the, the headshot as well. The king of facial expressions. Jake, thank you for, uh, for coming on and talking about the Pelicans. Of course. Thanks for having me on, Josh. And that will do it for me today. Another show.
We do have one more preview coming. I'm going to talk San Antonio Spurs. I don't know when it's coming out, but it's coming out soon. Um, so I'm going to record that right after this, and then we'll get that out. But follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. If you're on YouTube, thumb it up. Drop your comments down below. Hey, is Zion going to drop 30 points? A season? That's not a season. I hope he does. 30 points per game this year? Yeah, I reckon it's close. Drop it down below what you think, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.